been preparation for this grand conclusion, this final point. Everything has been leading up to a verse that you know really well. Choose you this day whom you will serve. These are Joshua's last words. A state of the nation report with an appeal to the gathered people not to come to him, but to come to the Lord. Look at chapter 24, verse 1. Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel, for their heads, for their judges, and for their officers, and they presented themselves before God. This is not about Joshua. This is not about Joshua at all. This is about God. And he gathers them together, purposefully assembling them at Shechem, a significant place in Israel's history. It was in Shechem that God first appeared to Abram with a promise to give him the land and to his offspring. That's where he built an altar to express his faith in that promise. Later, Jacob would build his own altar in the same place after he had purchased land, having been reconciled with his brother Esau. And the gathered guests here in chapter 24 had been here before too. Because in chapter 8, after their... Uh, humiliating defeat at Ai. Remember, they, they came together in the shadow of Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. And that's the place where Israel reaffirmed their covenant with Yahweh. Shechem is some significant real estate. At the very spot where God promised the land to Abram, God now gives the land to Joshua. It's come full circle. Promises made, promises kept. This will be the land I will give to you. Abram, a nomad, uh, roaming, just having left Ur of the Chaldees. And now, at this glorious time, the nation has control of the land, and Joshua brings them together before the Lord, and he says, This is what God promised you. Look around. Smell the air. As far as your eye can see, this is God's land, and he has given it to you. Our text today is going to be first half of this wonderful chapter, chapter 24, where we will see that with ownership comes responsibilities. It was true then and it's true now. Father, help us as we would study your word. We thank you for the worship. We thank you for the opportunity to come into your presence. You have moved us. You have brought us before you. and You've changed us and you, you would challenge us now, we pray, Father, as we take your word, as we worship you through the discipline of Bible study. And by your spirit, would you make application to our lives? May this be something that affects us not just the next half hour, or not even the rest of the day or the week, but, Father, all of our lives. May we be able to say with Joshua, as for me and my house, we, we will serve the Lord. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to see, first of all, that God has given his people a chance. He has brought them here. He has done the work. And it's an amazing time for them to look back. You know, it was interesting as I was talking to uh, my wife and my son last night about how many times we need to be reminded of things. It just seems like we forget. I can remember God's blessings, and five minutes later, when something happens to me, I'm all falling apart again. And so Joshua is going to remind them again. And so he does that here by talking about their past. And I want you to see that Israel's past was defined by God's grace. And that's such an important point. Israel's history, Israel's story, Israel's past has been defined quite literally by the grace of God. And Joshua gives us examples. He, God brought them up in the beginning years, verses 2 through 4. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, your fathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor, dwelt on the other side of the river in old times, and they served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from the other side of the river, led him throughout all the land of Canaan, and multiplied his descendants, and gave him Isaac. To Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau, and to Esau I gave the mountains of Seir to possess. But Jacob and his children went down to Egypt. In those beginning years, his father Abraham, who was a pagan, His father made idols for a living. He knew nothing of the true God, but God broke into his life. We don't know that he was seeking for God. There's no verse that says that. God was seeking him, and he rescued him, and he he took him from sin, and he gave him the faith to believe, and he called him out to do his will. Verse 3 covers everything from Genesis 12 to 21. It's a very busy verse. Verse 3. And the people of Israel knew their history. 
when they remembered, and I imagine they're saying, Amen, Amen, because throughout those early years, those beginning years, when when Abraham was chosen, just because of God's choosing, it had nothing to do with Abraham, when God did that, His grace took Abraham out and took Abraham through. And so we see that God's grace was there in the early years. And then we see, secondly, that God brought them out in the bondage years. Verses 5 through 7 speak about the exodus from Egypt and the wilderness wandering. Verse 5, by the way, covers all of Exodus 1 through 12. It's another busy verse. Also, I sent Moses and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt according to what I did among them. Afterward, I brought you out. Then I brought your fathers out of Egypt, and you came to the sea. And and the Egyptians pursued your fathers with chariots and horsemen to the Red Sea. So they cried out to the Lord, and he put darkness between you and the Egyptians, brought the sea upon them, and covered them. And your eyes saw what I did in Egypt. Then you dwelt in the wilderness a long time. And so there's this this whole idea of what what God was doing. I, I sent Moses. I plagued Egypt. I brought you out. Verse 6 talks about the crossing of the Red Sea. Information that's distant history. They, I did this for them. I did this for your fathers. There's a sense of them being involved as we get closer to verse 8. But it's more so about the past. We move into verse 7 and then verse 8 exclusively. He talks about their experience. They become as you. Beginning in verse 7 and then exclusively in verse 8 and on. And what sticks out to me is God's use of the first person. I counted 17 times that he says, I did this. I brought you out. I took you through. I raised up your forefathers. I did this 17 times. The, the grace of God was, was involved in their lives in a personal way every step of the way. And so he says, I have, I have been there all along. My grace has defined your past. I brought you up in the beginning years. I brought you out in the bondage years. I brought you through the belligerent years, the years as they were in the wilderness. According to verse 7, the the last part says, And Israel was in the wilderness a long time. And I bet you it felt longer than even it was. Those were not the best of times. And may I be frank with you, Israel was an absolute brat in the wilderness. Everything God did for them, they complained about. They wanted to go back to Egypt to eat onions by the Nile to go back into bondage and servitude. They were belligerent and they were rebellious. Remember Psalm 78, this verse sums it up in verse 40. How often they provoked him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. Incorrigible, brats, rebellious children. And yet God loved them. He led them. He fed them. He protected them. His grace never diminished a bit, even though they did not deserve it and proved it there. Oh, yes, God's grace defined Israel's past. He brought them up in the beginning years. He brought them out of the bondage years. He brought them through the belligerent years. And he brought them in. He brought them in during the battle years. And we see that here as verses 8 through 13, bring them right back to up to the recent history, right? God defeated the Amorite kings Sihon and Og, giving the two and a half tribes on the east side of the Jordan their portion. We see that in verse 8. Now Joshua says in verse 8, And I brought you into the land of the Amorites, who dwelt on the other side of the Jordan, and they fought with you. But I gave them into your hand, that you might possess their land, and I destroyed them from before you. But then in verses 9 and 10, he talks about Balaam, who had been paid by Balak to curse the people of Israel. And God says, I protected you from the treachery of Balaam. Verse 9, Then Balak the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose to make war against Israel and sent and called Balaam the son of Peor to curse you. But I would not listen to Balaam. Therefore he continued to bless you. So I delivered you out of his hand. Remember that wonderful story where Balaam opened his mouth to curse the people of Israel and all he could do was bless them. He was trying so hard to curse, but God wouldn't let him do that because God controls Everything He said, I was gracious to you. I was gracious to you when you didn't deserve it. I was gracious to you when you didn't know me. I was gracious to me when you didn't know it. I was gracious. I was gracious. I was because I am grace. And then we see he defeated a host of nations to give the rest of the land to the nine and a half tribes. And we see that as the text continues. Verse 11, Then you went over the Jordan and came to Jericho. 
And the men of Jericho fought against you. Also the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Gergesites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. But I delivered all the ites into your hand. I was there for you. That was me doing that. Hello, that's me. You looking for a sign? I'm your sign. Look what I did for you. Israel's past was defined by the grace of God. There was no way they got to where they were because of themselves. There was no way on earth that anything good that happened to them was because they were good, they were special, they were smart, they'd gone to the right schools. They were a stumbling, failing people who knew not God, and God made them into a nation. God made them into a people, and God brought them up and in and out and through. And you know something? Their past is our past as well. You and I have had a, a past defined by grace. Before we were saved, God says he chose us. Before I knew that there was a God who loved me, God loved me. Before I understood it, God was working in my heart. Then he called me to himself, and I responded in faith and trusted him as a small lad of five, five years of age. I didn't know anything except that Jesus loved me and died for me. And that was enough. I chose him. I've been following him since. But that was because of him. Spiritually speaking, Israel's experience is our own. In Romans 4.11, it says that he, Abraham, might be the father of all those who believe, though they are uncircumcised. Raise your hand. That's you, the Gentiles, not the Jews, right? He came to the Jews first, but it was always part of his plan that he'd do the Gentiles as well. For my God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So he, Father Abraham, is the father of all those who believe, though they are not Jewish, Jewish that righteousness might be implied to, uh, imputed to them also. And take the word them out in your imagination and stick your word there. That righteousness would be imputed to you and to me as well. And so we enter into that spiritually, the very history that God gives here. Grace has defined our past. It is a feature of God's character, and so it will always be a feature of life because grace is God and God is grace. It doesn't change with different people. It doesn't change because we have a New Testament. It doesn't change because of any region of the country we're from. God has done that for us. And I love Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. This is our past. In the rest of Ephesians chapter 1, he talks about these things. He says, He has chosen you in Him before the foundation of the world. And so election is ours. He says as well, He says as well that there we are adopted. Wow. When they come, they come. We are redeemed. We have forgiveness of sin. We have the knowledge of God's will. We have an eternal inheritance, a kingdom. And a city not made with hands. My friends, God's grace defines our past. These are not things that I did or received because I was good. I can't adopt myself. I can't birth myself, right? I can't choose myself. That's not how it works. God did this for us. And His grace has been sufficient. These are gifts from His hands. We contribute nothing to the list. We can add nothing further. Grace alone defines our past. God chose us in the beginning, brought us out of sin's bondage at our conversion, brought us through years of our rebellion in our younger years. He has delivered us into the victorious Christian life we enjoy today, and someday he's taking us out and up and away. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. It's all of grace. It's all of grace. That's our past. And because of that, because of what God has done for us in the present, God gives his people a choice. He did then. He does now. So we look at chapter 24, verses 14 and 15. Again, if I ask the average Christian what they know about the book of Joshua, they say there's some city and a wall coming down. They probably even know it's called Jericho because we have the song that we used to sing. And they would remember Joshua chapter 1 about um, uh, trusting the Lord and, and following his word and so on. And they would remember what? 24. They'd skip right to the end. This is the verse that we all know. Now, therefore... Fear the Lord, that therefore is important. Now, therefore, because of God's grace in the past, fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in completeness, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we 
will serve the Lord. And the people answered and said, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. Count us in. Obedience is not automatic, and it's not passive. We need to make a decision to follow the Lord. You get saved once. You pray to receive Christ, and He is yours eternally. Everlasting life wouldn't be everlasting if you could lose it every time you sinned. Right? We weren't saved by our good works, so we can't lose salvation by a, by a bad work. We are saved, and we are secure in Him. That's the only way it works. That's the consistent message of the Old and the New Testament. But the decision to obey God is something that we need to keep on making, keep on doing, keep on following through. And there are only options, two options. Serve the false gods of the world, is the first one, or serve the true God found in the Word. Serve God or serve God's. Serve truth or serve error. Serve light or serve darkness. There's only two options. Now, Israel knew about this from firsthand experience. At different times in their history, they had served the gods of their forefathers. They're mentioned in the text. The gods of the Nile. Egypt had so many gods, he couldn't even count them all. Hundreds. Each of the plagues was directed at one of their false gods. You think that's a god? Let me show you what the true god does, says Yahweh. And yet they served the gods of their forefathers in Ur of the Chaldees. They served the gods of Egypt. Even the false gods around them in this land, Canaanite, Canaan. One of the key gods of the Amorites was, was Moloch. And Moloch re- required the death, the sacrifice of newborn children. And they were following, some of them were following that god. What's that all about? With all that God has done in the past, with the grace that he has given to you, what are you doing following any of these gods? They've done nothing for you. The Bible says they have mouths, but they speak not. Ears they have, but they hear not. Hands, but they handle not. Feet they have, but they walk not. I was reading in my devotions yesterday, and Jeremiah says, Shame on the metalsmiths who make metal idols, because they are useless to them and to you, and they bring you into a snare. That's Doug Carlson version, but that's what uh, Jeremiah 51 17 kind of says. But the idea was, don't go with the past. Get rid of your idols. Put them away. Make a clean break with paganism. Now, is that easily done? No. Why do we hang on to false gods in the first place? Because they give us comfort. There's something about having a God you can hold that makes you feel in control. There's something about being able to look at it every day and say, I must be okay, and I'm going to pray to this thing. And you and I don't do this with things made out of wood and and, and stone, but we have things that we hang on to, do we not, that are not God? How many times, have you ever said to yourself, I wish God would just show up? Have you ever wished for a visible God that you could see? It's very difficult. We tell people, we, we share the gospel with people, and they say, where is God? Introduce him to me. And you can't say, behind curtain number one, here he is. He's not sitting in the car waiting. He's not sitting at the table. Not physically. And yet God says he is there, and we know that. So sometimes we, we enjoy things we can hang on to. So we hang on to our money, because money is real. In, in, in God we trust, it says, right? And I got this amount in the bank, and so I know that's secure, yeah, maybe. I have these friends, I have this job, I have all these things. And so we treasure those things. They're convenient, they're non-controversial. Has anybody ever in the world said that it's weird to worship money? But if you worship Jesus, you're an oddball. So gods we can carry make us feel like we're in control. While entrusting ourselves to one who demands complete control over our lives, well, that puts us out on a limb that we don't want to go out on. Now, it's really interesting, isn't it? Verse 14. Do you understand verse 14? I sure do. But how about verse 15? If it seems evil to you to serve the Lord. Has that ever kind of bothered you before? He's talking to the people of God. If I said to you today, if you think it's evil to serve God, then don't do it. Or, or just the idea of seeing it as evil is something that's foreign to us. But Joshua is saying it is a decision that you have to make. Joshua is saying it's going to cost you something. Joshua is saying what the Bible says, that you need to deny yourself. You need to give something up. And the word evil here is not even the main word for evil. The word for evil that we typically see talks about sinfulness. This word for evil has the idea of a, of a, of a mistake, uh, something harmful, something bad. If you think it's too much, if you think it's a bridge too far to give God everything, if you think it's going to be a mistake, he says, make the decision anyway. Get over that lack of faith. 
Get over that concern. That's the devil. That's the world telling you, don't get carried away with this Jesus stuff. Give him part, but not all. No, he says, I want you to give it all. I want you to take the risk. I want you to take the step. I want you to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind, even as you love him with those same areas. Because what you gain will always be greater than anything that you will lose. He is saying, get rid of those gods. Get rid of that stuff and serve the true God found in the word of God. The one who made everything. The one who made Israel into a nation. Who brought them out of Egypt. Who established them in a good land as he promised. And yes, the same one who's done that for us. Last night I was going to go to bed early. I don't do that like ever. I just thought, you know, I, I, I was reading a book. I finished the book. Um, TV was boring like most times. Maybe I need more channels. No, maybe I don't. I just, I've got good taste. TV was boring. The book was done. I said, why would I sit here? I'm going to go to bed. Well, then I remembered I was going to bed that I get an extra hour. I mean, so that was kind of cool. I texted my kids. Don't forget. Because I figured, because I forget, they might forget. No? Okay. Well, anyway, I sent that out to them. And I went to bed and I started playing music. I have records from my past. And I sat there just rejoicing. And then I wasn't rejoicing. I was weeping. And then I was rejoicing again. And it was a great time with the Lord. And I, I didn't feel tired. And I said, thank you, Lord. I didn't pray to sleep like I usually do. Right? When you can't go to sleep, you say, Lord, what is it? I said, Lord, what do you have for me? And I was listening to songs. And some of the songs from my past. The name of the album is Precious Memories. Some of us know what that's all about. And I love listening to the songs rejoicing in who God is. And I recommitted myself to the Lord again. Oh, a hundredth time, thousandth time, I poured my heart out to my Lord. I said, I love you, Lord. I've failed you. Oh, I made my pillow, my tears. And I gave the Lord myself again. I know you've done that as well. To give to him all that you are and then to do it again. Because we have a tendency to forget. We need to serve the Lord. Why? Not to gain grace. That's already ours. The covenant of grace is not an agreement between two equal parties. Give me a break. It's not a trade-off. It's not God brings everything to the table, and I bring everything, and we swap. And I have nothing to do with it. Grace is all of God, and life is all of grace. And he called me. He snatched me. He helped me make my getaway from the world that I was having fun. And I was dead and loving it in myself, in my worldly beliefs. But he chose me, and he snatched me, and he saved me. I have grace. You have grace. Grace is a gift from a sovereign to a subordinate, from a boss to a servant. And the master has given us clearly defined responsibilities, and he has the right to do that. This is not a negotiation. So last night I didn't say, hey, Lord, here's what I can give you. Give you two of those. I'll give you three of mine. I was abject, subordinate, humble. Oh, God. Oh, God, what do you want? And what can I do? And why haven't I done better? We serve God because we're commanded to do so. The word serve is found seven times in these two verses. And God's trying to give us an inkling. How should we serve him? According to Joshua, serve the Lord with fear and sincerity, with fear. Not a paralyzing horror. You know, the the channels that I do get, we have some cable channels, not too many. We don't get into the the junk channels, if you know what I mean. Um, But we have some cable channels. So every once in a while they have a free weekend where they bring a little junk into your house free of charge, you know. There's channels that aren't what I want to have in my house. But I looked at the uh, titles, and throughout the week it was Psycho and The Birds and, and The Horror on Elm Street or whatever that one is. And all the Chucky, to me Chucky is, you know, a place you go to buy pizza at. But I guess it's not that. All these horror films, all these terrible things. And the fear of the Lord is not horror. It's not terror. It's not paralyzing fear. It's a reverential and a humble awe. Reverence is the only attitude a truly redeemed sinner will have before a holy God. Reverence on the inside leads to service on the outside. When should we serve him? And I love this part. What does it say here? Choose you, what? This day whom you will serve. But do you know something? As I mentioned earlier, it's not a one-time only decision. Romans 12, 1 tells us to place ourselves on the altar of dedication as a living sacrifice. And what do we always say about a living sacrifice? It keeps crawling off the altar. We need to make that decision daily. This day is today. This day is tomorrow day. This day is every day that we live. Serve, in the text, is a continuous action. 
verb. Now, we don't think about that because we talk in present tense. But when he says, serve this Lord, he is saying, serve, keep on serving, never stop serving, serve with all your serving, serve. It, it's not as, it, as simple as we make it. He says it's, it involves the past and the present and the future. It's, it's as if Joshua said this, I have chosen to serve the Lord. I am choosing to serve the Lord. I will go on choosing to serve the Lord. A child of God chooses and never quits choosing. You see, we're, like I said, we're saved through one decision. And we're brought into the family of God. But we need to be reminded and so to keep on choosing. So the idea, whenever you see serve the Lord, please see keep on in front of it. Keep on serving. Keep on serving the Lord. Keep on choosing Him. This day must be every day. Constantly, we need to leave behind the sins of the past. Constantly, we have to resist peer pressure in the moment. Constantly, we have to invest well in the future. So there are two options. You can't choose both. You can't straddle this particular fence. Choose sovereign or self, master or money, love the world or love the word. Those are the only two options that we have. Has Joshua done his job? If Joshua has done his job, because back in chapter 1, he served the Lord. Now we're in chapter 24. He's 110 years old. He's about, he's about to go to glory. Has he done his job? His final statement is this. Verse 15. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He's done his job in his own life, in his own family. The nation responds in verse 16 that they are going to serve the Lord. But the question is for us. If Joshua has done his job, and if I have done my job, and if the series of messages has done his job, his job, you'll be able to say what I'm going to ask you to say with me in a moment. You'll be able to say, because of God's grace defining my past, because of God's grace demanding my present, because of God's grace delighting my future, would you say this with me? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And that's a statement that we make before the Lord in the presence of his saints. You know, Lord willing, next week we're going to take one more swing at the book of Joshua and move into Judges just to show how long, how long that works with the people. But we're basically done with the book. I pray that you would have learned and relearned things as I have from our time together. Let's pray. God in heaven, we love you today. Love is not all goosebumply oceans of emotions and giggles and all those things. Oh, that's got something to do with love. We're not talking about that kind of love. Our love for you is shown by our, our service, our obedience, our faithfulness. We don't gain grace that way. We have grace in abundance. But we show that we are recipients of grace when we live for the one who gave us grace. And I pray you'd help us, Father God, that it was all said and done, that we would come down to the end of the message and the end of the book, and that we would be able to say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Because that's radical, because that's uh, obscene to the world, because they don't get it, because they think it makes us haters. It makes us intolerant. It makes us stupid. It makes us deplorable. Whatever the word, that's okay. There is a risk. And we've counted it. And as for us and our house, we will serve you, Lord. I hope all God's people can say, Amen.